Welcome back to this uh, fifth and final session of our module on the study of uh, the teaching of Colossians and Ephesians. Uh, I'm Derek Tidball. Uh, in this final session, we're going to be looking at the second half of Ephesians, uh, chapters four to six, and we'll be doing so under four themes, four different subjects as it moves through the application of the gospel that has been expounded in chapters one to three. Firstly, we'll look at serving and uniting. Second, we'll look at character and conduct. Thirdly, we'll look at submitting and loving. And fourthly, at fighting and praying. One of the crucial things that uh, I ought not need to emphasize to you who are listening to this module, uh, but is always worth doing, is just to remind you uh, of the importance of the word therefore. In chapter 4 and verse 1, uh, we read, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And you'll know that whenever you see therefore, you need to look back and find out what's led up to it. What follows is not just moral advice or a practical way of living, but what follows in the practical application of the gospel is the outworking of all the truth and teaching that Paul has been engaged in in the first three chapters. There's no point in teaching morally without that spiritual gospel foundation which we've learned about in the first three chapters. People would be unable to achieve anything. All that Paul is now going on to say is the outworking of the new life that we have as we have been raised with Christ. So let's turn to the first of those four themes, which is that uh, we are to both serve and be united in the church. The opening six verses of chapter four are all about unity in the church. And the focus is not on the great interdenominational discussions that have held sway for so long. It's not on ecumenism between the denominations. There were different churches, as we know, uh, some that had different emphases. Some had a more Jewish complex and complexion, some a more Gentile complexion. Uh, but where the rub comes is on the quality of relationships that you get in a local church when you're meeting with people, working with people, praying with people, week in, week out, day in, day out, when you know them well. Uh, and that's where we need to demonstrate humility and gentleness and patience and bear one another, maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's easy to love people theoretically from a distance. Loving people when you meet them daily and when you know them too well is another issue. And Paul is acutely conscious of the need within the local church for the quality of relationships to reflect well, actually, the Trinity, not just the compassion of Christ, which is evident and which will come out, but unity is built on the very nature of God himself. That's why Paul goes on to say, uh, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your court, one Lord one faith and one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You remember how that opening chapter, the great paean of praise that just erupts from Paul's mind and heart is a Trinitarian praise. And here again we have the Spirit and the Son and the Father all telling us that though they were three persons of the Trinity, uh, and the, though they had different functions within the Trinity, uh, 
they were actually one. The very basic bedrock belief of Judaism, the Lord your God is one. And, and since that's the very nature of God, we as his people must reflect that nature in our relationship with one another. So the unity of the local church is uppermost in his thinking and a prior call on our lives. It's not good enough to avoid one another, to speak ill of one another, to distance ourselves from one another, to look down on other members of the church. We need to be characterised by a genuine love and acceptance of one another, no matter what one's gender is, one's race, one's background, one's education level, one's income level, what language people speak. Oneness in the local church is vital. And Paul goes on to perhaps explain without saying this is because. Uh, he perhaps goes on to explain why he introduces this topic of unity. Because in verses 7 to 16, he talks about the diversity that you'll receive, you'll, you'll witness within the local church, a, a diversity of gifts. We're not all the same. We do have different spiritual testimonies, different spiritual pilgrimages, different spiritual experiences, maybe. Uh, and certainly we have different gifts so that some see the church through one lens and others see it through another. All these gifts, as we may have learned from 1 Corinthians 12, are gifts that God has given through the ascended Lord. He quotes Psalm 40 there, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. Uh, and in the original, if you look back, you'll read like a, a victorious general. He received gifts from men. Conquering generals brought their booty back home from the areas, from the territories they conquered. But such is our God that actually he doesn't receive gifts, but he gives gifts. He pours out his grace. And so uh, Paul uses the alternative translation, the Septuagint version, to say that he gives gifts to men. And then he begins to explain what the gifts are. In verse 11, he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Now, whether he meant by this that this is the pattern from which you shouldn't deviate and there should always be a fivefold ministry you should identify and be led by. That's what many people have thought. Or whether this is a representative list rather than a full list of the gifts of the Spirit, that it stands for other gifts, that these are important gifts that lead to the maturing of the church, but they're not the only gifts. That's a matter of debate. But certainly they're important gifts, and if we've neglected any one of them, then we have done ourselves uh, uh, a disservice in the church and the weaker for it. He gave the apostles. That word is used in two senses in the New Testament uh, uh, to speak exclusively of the twelve, uh, but then in a wider sense of missionaries who've been sent. That's the original meaning of the word apostle, apostello. Uh, and uh, they are the church planters. Uh, it, we can't be sure as to whether he's using the narrow or the wider definition. Give it, but given the context and what he's already said uh, at the end of Ephesians 2, he probably means the narrower definition, the 12 apostles and their apostolic teaching, which are the foundation of the church. The prophets we've already again encountered at the end of chapter 2. He might well be referring to the Old Testament prophets or to the important gift of prophecy that is bringing an immediate word from God to a local congregation under the inspiration of the Spirit. 
as we see practiced in 1 Corinthians 14, for example. Then there are the evangelists, the people who have the particular ability to articulate the gospel and to win a response or provoke a response in people's lives. All of us are called to be witnesses, but some people in particular have the gift of an evangelist. The final two gifts might go together, pastors and teachers. That's because in the Greek he uses just a different construction. He said the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists up to now. But now he uh, doesn't use the fifth the and simply says the pastors and teachers. Certainly the pastoral gift and the teaching gift do need to go hand in hand, but many would argue that they're distinctive gifts, pastors having very much more a, a gift of being people orientated and not just giving care. But actually in the New Testament, the pastoral role was to produce maturity in people's lives, which, as we saw in Colossians, would often involve admonition. Uh, enabling people to grow up in Christ, not just saying, there, there, it's okay. So pastors who care and enable people to grow to maturity. And you do that as you teach the truth, as you expound the gospel and its implications and teaching. So there are five gifts, at least, which are vital for the healthy maturity of the church. And Paul explains that uh, that's their purpose. They are not there to do all the work of the church, but they're there to build up the church and to release the gifts of others so that they do the work of the ministry in the wider world. And their role is to produce not instability, but stability, growth which is well grounded in Christ. And we're to grow into Christ more and more, so our focus in the local church, as we unite together and serve using our different gifts, is that we might be those who so exude Christ and so demonstrate Christ to a watching world that they encounter him for themselves. Yes, we that will involve us speaking the truth, but it's not always good to speak the truth bluntly or in an untimely fashion. We speak the truth in love, which means we take into account the effect we will have in doing so on other people, and particularly, perhaps, the opportune moment, the timing, when the truth can be heard. Uh, and our task as leaders in the church is that the whole body is joined together and held together. And when every part works properly, well, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Paul's first concern of the outworking of the gospel is that we serve one another using the gifts that God has given. But that may create tensions because uh, uh, the prophets may be up and at it. Uh, the pastors may want to say, hang on a moment. The teachers may be saying, no, no, it's all here in the text. Whereas the prophets say, no, we need it. Uh, an immediate contemporary inspirational word from God, an exhortation, never mind all this uh, a doctrine business. The evangelists might well be saying, let's leave all that behind and go ahead and win others for Christ. So there may indeed be tensions, but our task is to contribute our gift to the building up of the body. And then Paul turns to the subject of character and conduct. Much of this is material that we've come across before, 
in Colossians or even earlier in Ephesians. But it's given in starker detail, in greater detail. Uh, he's already talked about the dreadful state of the Gentiles, presumably the majority of the church in Ephesus. He's spoken of the way in which they're without hope and strangers to God and outside the covenants of Israel. And now in chapter four, he gives a devastating critique of their position, of the way in which they are totally lost in darkness. Uh, I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Our lifestyle must be so different. Why? Because they're governed by the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from God because of the ignorance that is in them. And that isn't just a, uh, an accidental mindset or just an outworking of their culture. No, no, they do it due to the hardness of their hearts. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They do it because actually they don't want to live a godly life. Original sin has taken a grip on their lives. They're slaves to sin and they indulge themselves in immediate passions, thinking that that's the way to find satisfaction in life. It's what Jesus said in John 5, isn't it? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And as I said, when we were looking at chapter two, it's very easy to think that everybody around us in our class, in our uh, neighborhood, in our community, in our workplace, well, they're basically nice people. But here's this devastating critique again. Far from it, from God's viewpoint, they're addicted to evil, fundamentally adrift in their thinking, twisted in their morality. And they need rescuing from that. And we, as believers in Christ, shouldn't compromise in any way with their lifestyle seeing how far we can sail close to the wind before we've offended the spirit. Rather, we should live very differently, alternatively. Uh, how do you view those that you know outside of Christ? It makes a difference if you buy into this devastating critique that Paul offers to the Ephesians. They, of course, were surrounded in Ephesus by the worshippers of Diana or of Artemis uh, as a naval port. They were subject to huge uh, sexual immorality, as any naval port is. Uh, they were committed to magic, as we know from Acts chapter 19, and to indulging in all sorts of occult practices. But it's not just Ephesus that Paul is talking about. He doesn't say uh, no longer walk as the Ephesians do, but as the Gentiles as a whole do. So how should we be different? Believers are renewed in Christ and our lifestyle should be altogether different. Just in passing, he uses a very interesting uh, phrase in verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Remember when Paul was preaching the gospel in Ephesus, he took the school hall of Tyrannus for a number of years and taught the gospel. It's an unusual way of speaking about the gospel and of conversion. But there's an undoubted educational re-educational element in our coming to Christ. Uh, and he uses the same imagery as he did in Colossians 3, 4, where he talks about putting off and putting on a new wardrobe in Christ, an imagery that, as we said, may well have come from the practice of baptism, where someone 
put off their old set of clothes, in fact were baptised naked, uh, and then put on a new set of clothes. And our calling is not just to stop doing certain things, but to adopt new practices which are wholesome. The old practices we reject are destructive, the new practices are constructive. And if there's a difference between Ephesians and Colossians, well, it, it's just the way in which Paul emphasises that. Uh, look, for example, at verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal. So that's a great achievement, isn't it? If you're part of a subculture, if you've been brought up uh, to just uh, purloin other people's goods or burgle houses, as some people have been, to stop doing what has been a lifetime's practice or even an occasional error can be very difficult. That's an achievement. But the important thing, says Paul, is let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. It's not that you stop being a pain in the neck. <laughs> in society, robbing people of their rightful goods. It is that you stop doing that and then you start contributing. You start constructively adding to the community by the things you do, you make, the money you earn, the taxes you pay, the gifts that you give in charity. It's one thing to stop the negative practices it's another thing to put on the very positive practices. Uh, he illustrates similarly in the uh, next verse, verse uh, 29, the same issue from the point of view of speech. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Uh, we might say from elsewhere, uh, stop swearing. But it's not just a question of stop swearing, is it? Uh, stop lying. Stop putting other people down. Stop those cutting remarks. Stop that gossip. A whole range of issues in terms of speech. You know, true, wise speech was fundamental to a Jewish ethic. You only have to read through the book of Proverbs to see how often it comes up or how much attention is given to it in the letter to J of James. So there's a, a way of speaking which is very common which we're not to uh, adopt. But again, conquering that is one thing, but doing something positive is another. And we're not only called to stop using corrupting talk, as the terminology is here, but we're to speak in such a way as is good for building up, as fits the occasion. Uh, that it may give grace to those who hear. Are people blessed by our conversation? Or do they go away wounded or just indifferent? We should bless them positively in the way in which we speak. Uh, goes on, let all bitterness uh, and uh, wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away, put off, along with all malice. But put on, don't just become neutered. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Well, I'm sure you've got the message by now that uh, Christian holiness is about the creation of a warm, positive, upbuilding way of life, a wholesome way of life that blesses others. It's not just about avoiding what's bad. There are any number of uh, gems uh, woven through this passage and the verses in chapter 5 that uh, follow. We could latch on to verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, again, actually, the Trinity is involved here. Verse 30 of chapter 4 speaks about the Holy Spirit, uh, 
and uh, we'll go on to be talking about God the Father and Christ the Son in chapter 5. Uh, the link at the end of chapter 4 is uh, we're to forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. So Paul just latches on to that and, uh, and uh, focuses for a moment in chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 to so as God in Christ forgave you, yeah, imitate God. Wow, what a calling. Just as God would react in mercy, in kindness, in forgiveness. So we are called to represent him and imitate him in our relationships. Uh, and then in uh, verses 3 uh, to uh, 14, where he's talking about uh, putting aside sexual immorality and covetousness and filthy uh, uh, foolishness and filthy talk, crude joking, things that we've already highlighted, uh, the need to lead a life of purity, and buried in that is the important truth that actually as we do this we please Christ. We are not doing this just for our own ends but we try to discern verse 10 what is pleasing to the Lord. So we imitate God, we want to please Christ and we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And all that could be described uh, from verse 15 through to 21 of chapter 5 under the heading of, uh, well, walking wisely. There are other themes we could have taken. <laughs> the, the passage is so rich, one layer is there on another, so we could have latched onto the image of light and darkness. Uh, but I choose to highlight the... Uh, issue of wisdom look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise to walk wisely is to walk in the light to be aware of what's around of the traps of and of the impact that you might have on others to avoid the pitfalls and to live wholesomely so walking wisely uh, again, there's a great deal within scripture that unpacks that phrase, isn't there? Think again of the book of Proverbs, where so much daily practical wisdom is being outlined. Uh, and all this again is uh, about the way to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the wise way to live. Fascinating little thing in verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Um, several things that we could unpack from that. In the context, how does Paul measure a life which is filled with the Spirit? It's actually not in terms of the exercise of spiritual gifts. It's not whether you have ecstatic visions and experiences of God, uh, whether you can fast for days on end, whether you speak in tongues or whether you have the power to work miracles. No, it's much more down to earth, isn't it? The measure of being filled with the Spirit is whether you're living a clean, wise life. And just note the interesting contrast that is implied there. Do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but instead, by contrast, be filled with the Spirit. When you get drunk with wine, so I'm told, and Ephesian wine was notoriously pretty rough, so a lot of people would have got drunk on it. When you get drunk with wine, you actually become less than human. You lose your sense of discipline. Uh, your humanity is degraded. You're out of control. You do things that in your sober state you'd never dream of doing because it would be horrendous and is undignified. So don't get drunk with wine when you become less than human. 
but instead be filled with the Spirit. Be recreated in Christ. God's great purpose for you is that his image in you be restored. That you become the full human being, the ideal human being that God intended you to be. Well, so many different ways we could have unpacked that, but there's just a few headings on the way through. Let's move on to the third topic, which is that of submitting and loving. And again, he's going to go over ground that he's introduced in his letter to the Colossians. Uh, he's going to go over it in greater detail when it comes to husbands and wives, in less detail when it comes to slaves and masters. But basically, it's the same framework. The scholars do argue about this, but I'm firmly of the view that uh, verse 21 of chapter 5 not only sums up what has been said about wise living and ethical living up to now, about how people learned Christ, but actually is the headline for the household code that he's going to spell out from verse 22 onwards. So verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. If we submit to one another, we are not disruptive or divisive in the church. We give way. We recognise with humility and with patience that we may not always be right. It's a mutual submission, as it's sometimes said. The only argument you should have when you come to a door is as to who goes through it first and you should constantly defer to one another. You submit to one another. Submission is about uh, recognising your place and not being uppity in the world. I've taught quite a little bit in India and uh, I've never had the courage to drive in the city of Bangalore I'm thankful that I've always been driven because the roads there are apparently chaotic. It looks horrendous. But I make my Indian students laugh when I say to them, um, actually, the miracle is that there are not more accidents than there are. And the reason is because if you look carefully, drivers do actually submit to one another. And they don't believe me. But actually, if you look carefully, you're coming up to a junction. Dozens of cars or lorries, even more motorbikes with folks uh, riding on them uh, without uh, helmets and sometimes with their young children on their laps as well. It looked absolutely horrendous. But the reason why it works is that the people are usually making eye contact with one another and signalling my turn or I give way to you. And it is in fact an example, an illustration of the way in which people, even in that situation, see the value of submitting to one another. And we are called as Christians to practice this life of submission to God and Christ by his Spirit primarily but to one another in all our relationships as well. So it's a mutual submission. And in Ephesians, Paul comes to talk about the submission of wives to husbands in greater detail than he did in Colossians. And these verses have often caused horror and conflict in the church, people have reacted negatively to them, but partly because they haven't read them under that overall headline of what's being called for is a mutual submission. So wives are encouraged to submit themselves uh, to their husbands, verse 22, as to the Lord. Uh, and uh, this is one of the few places in the New Testament uh, 
where it said that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself is its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. The meaning of headship is debated. Uh, we uh, haven't got time to expound it here and now. It may not primarily mean the place of authority, which is how we read it in the 21st century in the Western world. It may have much more to do with prominence or even the source of things as uh, head of a river is the source of the river. That's a debate you'll have to explore somewhere else. But, but whatever the precise meaning, clearly the wife is being encouraged to take the humble position to make the relationship harmonious, not argumentative and not competitive. And the example given is in terms of Christ himself. Again, note this is an invitation to wives or an instruction to wives, not permission for the husband to make the wife submit. This is how Christian wives should voluntarily live. The task of the husband in this is just as demanding, if not more so. The word submission is not used of husbands, but under that uh, overall title that we read in verse 21, verse 25 onwards, when it's talking about husbands, is in fact spelling out what does it mean for a husband to submit? And this is what it means. Husbands, love your wives. Again, the pattern is Christ. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That led John Calvin and many of the reformers to speak of marriage in terms of being a little church. The purpose of loving is that uh, he might, the purpose of Christ loving us is that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. It's a very natural picture of the wedding day, isn't it? The bride doesn't go to her wedding uh, wearing the gardening clothes or the workaday clothes. Every bride I've ever encountered has booked the hairdresser beforehand, has gone to the beauty parlour, has spent time doing the makeup, has chosen the dress carefully and all the rest of it. And uh, Christ's purpose was to enable the church to be like that beautiful bride on her wedding day. And says Paul, in the same way husbands should love their wives. So you do everything as a husband, which will enable the wife to grow in holiness and in purity and therefore to use the gifts that God has put within their life, not to uh, stunt them, not to keep them in their place, but to enable them to flourish uh, as a bride does on her wedding day. Uh, so that doesn't mean to say you're going to abuse your wife, you're going to be boasting about your authority, I am the head, you do what I say. In fact, the word obedience doesn't come in here as it does in the traditional wedding service. And of course it means this, doesn't it? If we're loving our wives as Christ loved the church, well that involves the ultimate self-sacrifice, doesn't it? The ultimate self-giving. Christ loved the church by giving himself on the cross for the church, by submitting ultimately 
to the alien powers, the wrong and evil powers of the world. Christ is the example of submission. And we are called to submit to the same degree as Christ did for the sake of our wives. That's a tough call. So you see, it's a mutual submission. And where that happens, where the wife promotes the interests of the husband uh, and uh, upbuilds the husband first, and where the husband does the same to the wife, then you get a marriage that flourishes where you get jealousy where you get one partner doing down the other trying to keep the other in their place trying to make the other servile you don't get this sort of marriage that represents christ and the church from that more extensive explanation and that profound theological explanation paul turns to children and to parents uh, basically it's saying the same as he did in colossians children obey your parents in the lord for this is right that's the way you submit but fathers uh, because as we said when we looked at this in colossians uh, the educative role of uh, the uh, the the educative role was uh, considered to be that of the father in the ancient world. Uh, and so the focus here is on the father. And fathers, you're not to provoke your children to anger, uh, but rather to allow them again to flourish, bringing them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Remembering that God's discipline is often very, very patient with us. Uh, and then slaves and masters. He's expounded this more fully in Colossians, but he says the same thing here more briefly. We're to obey our earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart. You see the language of obedience comes in in terms of children and in terms of slaves, but not in terms of wives. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ not by the way of eye service as people pleasers but as servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart rendering service with a good will as to the lord uh, and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does he will receive back from the lord whether he's a slave or his master uh, do the same masters do the same and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and theirs has no partiality in him. So again, this mutual sense of both are accountable. Slaves essentially accountable to their masters and indirectly to the Lord. Masters directly to the Lord and both are to live in the light of God's presence. Both are to work in the light of God's presence. So it's the same sort of ground, which is no charter for the master to be authoritarian, to be bossy, to treat the slaves as property, but rather to treat them as being born in the image of Christ. It's a little bit of a puzzle as to why in Ephesians Paul spends further time on wives and husbands and less on slaves and masters and in Colossians it's the other way around. Some have suggested that the Colossian church was composed largely of slaves and that's why more attention is given it, to it there but that's just speculation. So there's the third topic we submit to one another and we love one another uh, in fact all of us not just husbands as christ loved the church then we come to the fourth and final major division and topic in ephesians uh, 
Uh, and that uh, is concerning the well-known passage about spiritual armour and the way in which we are involved constantly in spiritual conflict and a spiritual battle. Many people argue that Ephesians uh, is not specific to the church in Ephesus, could have been much more of a circular letter written to uh, uh, any number of churches. But I suspect from what we know of the background culture in Ephesus, here's a hint that it was written to the church in Ephesus, because we know that spiritual warfare was a very real fact in the experience of Christian believers in Ephesus. We know the presence of magic, the uh, recognition given to all sorts of supernatural powers was very evident in Ephesus. And maybe that's why this topic occurs here rather than elsewhere. It might be said that Paul is drawing on Isaiah and he's drawing on what he's already very briefly written of in 1 Thessalonians rather than uh, uh, inventing something which is new but he is certainly developing and exploring it in a way that isn't done elsewhere. So uh, let's look at the nature first of all of the battle in which we're engaged. Uh, firstly it's a defensive battle we're called to stand firm and be strong in the Lord. We'll come back to that because it's repeated in verse 13. The nature of this battle is that it's not uh, against flesh and blood, against seen realities, but against unseen realities. The language of Colossians 1 comes into play again. It's against rulers and authorities, against cosmic powers of the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are quite a number of people uh, involved in mission today who have really quite a secular mindset about their mission or evangelistic strategies. I've been to many, many conferences down the years listening to strategies and techniques of evangelism being unfolded and, and they have their place. But when all is said and done, at the end of the day, what you're hearing is a bit like a marketing strategy of selling cars or soap powder. If only we invest in things enough, if only we distribute enough adverts, if only we learn the right language, if only we pick up the right sound bite. But I've rarely heard in those circles the whole recognition that what we're involved in is a spiritual battle with unseen powers. And that the normal marketing techniques, the normal organizational growth principles, helpful though they are, are secondary to the battle against the unseen powers of the world. And that's Paul's focus here. A recognition that whenever we engage in conversation about Christ, we're not just trying to win somebody rationally to our belief system. It's not an ordinary conversation. But the spiritual dynamics kick on on both sides. The Holy Spirit on our side and a range of other evil spirits on the other seeking to deceive the person we're seeking to win for Christ. Corrupting their mindset, distracting them, a whole range of techniques that they will have to cause them to be blinded to the truth. So the nature is that it's spiritual warfare. And you'll know in verses 13 to 18 that Paul uh, uses the description of a Roman soldier as the basis for arguing the various elements of our uh, armour and of the weapons we're going to use. It's quite common uh, 
to go over this in great detail and comment in some fine detail. And there's value in doing that. Uh, so we take up the whole armor of God. Um, uh, and uh, that means that we uh, uh, are, are putting on the shoes uh, for feet having the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. Uh, all these things can be identified from a soldier's armour. Sometimes um, uh, a lot of uh, emphasis is put on uh, the use of the word uh, sword, the, the word chosen for sword, uh, being a, a short close combat sword rather than a, a longer one. Sometimes a great deal is made about the shield that a Roman army uh, adopts where they can interlock with one another uh, made of leather very often to prevent arrows from opposing armies getting through uh, there's good insight in all those things but whether Paul actually meant it in such detail or not I don't know what I think is more important is that when Paul is talking about these various pieces of armour He's doing so in what's often called both a objective and a subjective way. So, yeah, we have the uh, breastplate of righteousness. And that is that we have become righteous in Christ. That's the objective. But the subjective is that in our lives we live righteously. We have the shoes on our feet of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Well, Ephesians 2 has talked about Christ as our peace. That's the objective. But much of Ephesians spells out the way in which we need to live at peace with one another. That's the subjective. And uh, we take up the shield of faith. There is one faith, Paul said. Uh, in Ephesians 4 uh, and we have received that faith but now we exercise it day by day the helmet of salvation yes we are protected by the salvation that God has given but we also need to wear that helmet consciously day by day as we shelter behind uh, the gift of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god god's word given to us in the scripture revealed and objective but which we must also make our own so that we know how to wield it when the day comes so when you look through this armor uh, don't perhaps get sidetracked too much on the details of the Roman soldier. But do think of both the objective revelation of God in Christ and the subjective implication of that as you put on that armour for your own life. And the objective, as we introduced just at the beginning, is that we might be able to stand firm Paul's coming full circle, as it were. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, which is an implication, don't retreat, don't be defeated, don't give in, don't be discouraged. Um, but then in verse 13, uh, stand firm uh, in the armour that you're wearing against these spiritual forces when the evil day comes. And above all, stand firm. People have pointed out that there's no uh, armour to shield the back of the soldiers. There's no provision if they run away as cowards or retreat. And the armour is about defending yourself. Perhaps we need to learn that Actually, we're not strong enough to fight the battle. God fights the battle. The battle is the Lord's, not ours. But our task uh, 
and it's a great victory if we do so, is simply to hold the line, not give up and stand firm. It may come as a bit of a surprise that Paul doesn't mention prayer as uh, one of the weapons, uh, as it were. But actually, uh, in verse 18 onwards, he introduces prayer as a vital component of our being able to stand firm, of our success in this warfare. He doesn't identify it with a particular piece of armour, perhaps because it's too important. And if our enemies are unseen, then the great secret weapon we have is that of engaging with the almighty God in the unseen as we pray and release his power through the church in the world. And so we come to the greetings and the conclusion. Uh, unlike uh, most other letters, there are a few uh, personal greetings, uh, just a mention of Tychicus as Paul concludes. And that's one of the reasons why people tend to think this is a circular letter rather than an individual letter written to Ephesians. But notice that with the other letters, he brings the letter full circle and having wished them grace and peace to begin with. So in his final couple of verses, he speaks about peace and love and faith and grace, the fundamental basis of our faith and concludes with these words, grace be with you all who love the Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. No matter what life throws at you, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your failures, no matter what your discouragements, keep on loving because Christ loves you and make that love incorruptible.